Who likes crowds? Who likes getting into crowds? Sometimes when you get into a crowd and you want to get somewhere, it's frustrating, isn't it? I'm going to be late and it's awful. I can't get out of it. And I don't know where to go. But I'm stuck. Sometimes crowds are good. Sometimes crowds just uh, keep the excitement going because it's a combined uh, buzz that you have. And uh, sometimes when you're in crowds and you might have your children and generally your daughter will say, I can't see that, and so up she comes on your shoulders. So that's common, isn't it? We want everybody to be involved and to, to see as much as they can. And I can remember being at Expo and I was hating coming up to go because I hate crowds, but once I got here and got in the crowds, it was great and you enjoyed it. And so it was all part of the experience. We're going to talk about some experiences today and they're two separate ones. Just before we do that, Carolyn's going to give us a reading and then uh, Neil's going to give us the other part. And so as we do that, after that, we're going to uh, have a little PowerPoint which we'll have a look at. So thanks, Carolyn. So Mark 5, verses 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her, so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she fell in her body, felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realised that power had gone out for him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered. And yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. She, he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Thanks, Carolyn. Now, before Neil brings us the next one, we've got a short uh, PowerPoint which we're going to have a look at, and Kim's um, prepared that for us today. So. I want the video of the PowerPoint. I want the video. Video? Yeah, the video, not the, not the reading. The video, thanks. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I spent 12 years with a condition that no one understood. Because of my condition, the law had declared me unclean. 12 years of rejection and shame was almost more than I could bear. And then, one day, my world completely changed. I heard that a man named Jesus had come ashore. People spoke of him as being a great healer, one who healed with divine authority and divine power. Could this Jesus heal me, I wondered? Could this be the day that I have waited for for so long? Could I put my trust in one whom I've never seen? These questions became so big in me that my soul demanded an answer. But the voice of fear also wanted to be heard. Who do you think you are? 
your unclean, your defiled, your a woman. But something inside me wouldn't let go of my dream of being completely healed. was 
demon possessed and uh, healing him. And then he comes into the boat where there's large crowds over there. Over to the other side again, crowds were there because they knew he was there. So the excitement and the buzz was so great that you couldn't help but be caught up with it all. It was contagious. And it was like when we talk today, where were you? Do you remember where you were when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon? They would say, do you remember where you were when Jesus walked on this street? It was the same thing. You know what it must have been like? You know you've had one of those days when you've got your phone and it rings. So you take the phone, the landline, and you're holding it to your ear, and then the mobile will ring over there. So you've got the mobile ringing, you've just been talking on the phone, the doorbell rings and somebody comes to the door, the dogs are barking, and the oven tells you that it's ready. Everything's happening all at once. It would seem to be as if it was sort of a bit of chaos. Have you ever had days like that? I'm sure we have. Something similar was happening all at once. You know, when we have stories that are put together, like Mark has done for us now, they all had one thing in common. Each one of these stories, separate as they are, all had one thing in common. Uncleanliness. Uncleanliness. Contact with the dead. Contact with the grave. Contact with blood. Makes one ceremonially unclean. Jesus had been teaching at the right side. He had now come across and a group of lay people were there from the temple. And one of them, who was the synagogue ruler named Jairus, was there. Now, Jairus was well respected as a leading person in the community. But he was there in the crowd. And all of a sudden, this man who was so finely dressed in his beautiful clothes, he comes and kneels at the feet of Jesus, begging. Why? Why? Because he had something that compelled him more than anything that life could offer him. He was desperate. He was at his wit's end. His daughter was dying. And what father wouldn't take the advantage of any opportunity that they could have to free their daughter, to make them well again? You would grovel at the feet of this man who you think would be able to do this. William Lane in his book on Mark, he says this, Jesus had now moved away from the lakeside and was moving towards the house of Jairus. After Jairus was pleading with him, he said he would go. And as he's moving out towards them, William Lane says this, this woman was suffering an ailment for 12 years. It was a chronic hemorrhaging, similar to in the African society fistula, where the woman after childbirth has this incontinence and hemorrhaging. Going to the degree that it was unstoppable. And Mark tells us that she went to a number of of physicians at the time, she'd spent all that she had on a variety of treatments and none of it had worked. The processes used up all the money that she had. Nothing was able to cure her. Her existence was wretched. As that uh, video showed, she was an outcast from society. She was shunned. Her life was wretched. 
She was in a constant state of uncleanness. She was a recluse. She smelt and she knew it. She knew that Jesus was the answer. Jesus was the only thing now that could heal her from this state. Putting aside all her uncleanliness, all her shame, all her feelings of inferiority, she joins the crush. And the crush it was. They pushed and shoved. But she was even more determined. Because when you have a single focus, you're not going to let anything stop you, do you? And she knew she just had to get to him. And even just touch some part of him would be enough. <coughs> Can you imagine today security around a famous person who Jesus was at that time? Imagine the security today. Would she be able to get close to him? Of course not. But in verse 30 we read that Jesus turned around and asked, who touched my cloak? She managed to just touch the hem of his outer cloak. He knew that power had gone from him. The disciples, well they thought that Jesus had fled. Crowds so vast, they pushed and jostled and shoved. How could anybody tell who touched you? But Lane says power is the central element in the biblical concept of a personal God. Jesus possessed the power of God as a representative of the Father. Never less the Father remained in control of that power. The healing of the woman occurred through God's free and gracious gift. His decision to bestow upon that woman the power which was active in Jesus. And Jesus knew that that power had gone from him. Now Jesus wanted to help and to see that the woman really understood what had happened to her because there was so much mysticism and so much superstition and magic thought of at that time. He wanted to make sure how this woman was travelling right now. And when he realised that it was her grasp of faith and not of her hand that secured the healing, he knew that it was her faith that had healed her. And Jesus' final words to her was, Shalom, go in peace, a farewell blessing. Now go away, experiencing physical healing, experiencing a release from a lifetime of wretchedness and separation, spiritually free from the past also. Those of us who know of the profound experience of finding salvation in Jesus Christ experience the same feeling of relief. Because we're released from the uncleanliness of sin and the bankruptcy of life that it causes and the hopelessness of our wretched lives change, change forever. When touched by Jesus, our lives changed so dramatically, never to be the same again. And he says to us, Shalom, go in peace. There's a beautiful song I was thinking of as I was writing this. I will never know, I will never be the same again. I can never return. I've closed the door. I'll walk in faith. I'll run the race. And I will never do the same again. Beautiful song. But is that your experience? Is that what you're saying also? Now Jairus' faith is really, really stretched because friends from the house came as they're approaching the house and said, don't bother. It's all over. She's dead. Don't bother the teacher now. Leave him be. He's got enough to do. She's dead. Photo complete. 
It's all over. For taking only Peter and James and John. Getting there, they found that the professional mourners were already active and working their stuff. There was clapping, there was choral, singing, there was instruments. And because a man of his statue had to hire such a great professional crowd, because even the poorest had to hire two flute players and one professional mourner for a funeral. But being the synagogue ruler, he had to have more of a show than that. But Jesus cleared the room. He cleared the room because he said to them, she's only asleep. And they laughed. Which shows how much their emotions were with the crying and everything before. But now they just laughed. So it was all a show they were putting on any rate. And the parents and the disciples were there in that room, the only ones with Jesus. But God intervened in that room. Because in that room was the smell of death. And everybody in the room knew it. But God intervened. She lived. She lived by the power of God through Jesus as he raised her to life. And there's even a nice fine touch that Mark likes to remind us of how Jesus is concerned for the whole person in all the excitement and all the buzz and everything that was going on in the room as he took that girl's hand and lifted her up and she walks. He knew that she needed some food and he says, and don't forget to give her something to eat. I don't know whether it's significant or not, but she was 12. The woman with the hemorrhage that was healed suffered for 12 years. What's the relationship between her and the synagogue ruler? Well, socially, they are a gulf apart. But one thing united, their need. Their need, desperation. Jesus touched the dying and the dying touched Jesus on that journey. The result New life for both. Jairus and the woman fell at the feet of Jesus. All dignity God. Didn't worry what others thought or what they were thinking. She only touched the hem of his robe. Perhaps in our times of desperation and need and bankruptcy of life, we need to fall at his feet and glass, glass not the hem, but the whole world. Amen.